Hi all and welcome to the lecture on hearing. This is going to cover just a few pages in chapter 21 of the Lewis Med Surge book as well as the entirety of chapter 16 in the Miller text. So first off talking about good hearing, it's vital for important daily activities such as communication, um, protecting um, ourselves from threats or other dangers, and enjoyment and having a good quality of life such as being able to, able to hear voices and various sounds. Performing ADLs is highly dependent on good hearing. In addition, good hearing, you know, again, promotes communication and social interactions, assists in identifying potentially harmful situations, and promotes well-being and psychosocial wellness through the auditory sensation. In older adults, normal age-related changes combine with risk factors to affect our hearing wellness. So in this uh, PowerPoint, we're going to focus on nursing assessments and interventions that are related to promoting hearing wellness in the older adult. This is in your book talking about promoting hearing wellness in older adults and the process that we do so. And overarchingly, we want to look at the individual as a whole. So we're going to assess risk factors um, such as smoking, so say, you know, smoking, tobacco use, we're going to perform different testing, um, such as the hearing handicap inventory using stethoscope or not stethoscopes, using otoscopes, um, conducting psychosocial assessments, looking at them in their house, and lastly talking about referrals to promote individualized wellness, such as improving communication, increased social interaction, increased safety and functioning, and an overall better quality of life. So hearing begins in the external ear, and the, in the external ear, these are cartilaginous structures which localize sounds so that the source can be identified. Then it moves into the middle ear, and the primary function of the middle ear is to transmit sound energy or sound vibrations to the inner ear and to also protect our middle ear and our inner ear. Then we get into the inner ear, which is where the vibrations are received and then they're transmitted to the cochlea, which is a little snail-like looking thing, which then converts these sound vibrations into nerve impulses, which are then coded for intensity and frequency. The age-related changes then um, are listed in Table 16.1 in your book, and we talk about the age-related changes that occur in the external, the middle, and the inner ear and the auditory nervous system. Um, that can interfere with the normal processes um, and interfere with overall hearing functioning. So starting with the external ear, the, there is longer, thicker hair, especially in males. We know they get more ear hair. Um, the endothelial, the epithelial lining of the ear becomes thinner, drier, and we have increased keratin, which is that um, rough kind of epithelial layer. And all of this um, is going to kind of come together and cause a risk for impaired impaction with cerumen, which is our earwax is another word for that. So normally our cer cerumen is um, cleansing and protecting the ear, but if it becomes impacted, um, it can cause hearing loss and that can be reversible. Plus it's very amenable to other nursing interactions like um, monitoring, assessing, removing earwax and talking about the serumenolytic uh, medications later. So we really want to, to check that external ear and that's when we're gonna talk about our assessment later. So, in, so if we have these processes that interfere with the normal, process of expelling cerumen, we're going to increase the potential um, for it to get blocked and thus reducing um, conductive hearing pathway. In addition to ca causing hearing loss, impacted cerumen can cause pain, it can cause um, infection, otitis, tinnitus, which is a ringing in the ear, dizziness, fullness, and or coughing. Um, the good thing about cerumen impaction uh, is that it is preventable. And it, and it is amenable to many of our nursing interventions and it's a quick fix. The age-related changes listed under the middle ear that cause interference in the ability to con conduct sound vibrations. So some of these are like the tympanic membrane becomes more collagen, you know, has more collagen to it, collagenous, not how, sure how to say that, but there's less elasticity to that tympanic membrane. And this results in it being thinner and stiffer so it doesn't transmit the vibrations as well. 
Also, there's further degenerative changes to the ligaments around the tympanic membrane and in the middle ear, and this further um, diminishes the ability of the tympanic membrane to be elastic and, and conduct sound vibrations. Also in the middle ear, the tiny bones become calcified and that calcification doesn't let them vibrate right, like the, the stapes, those three little bones that are inside our middle ear. And so again, it interferes with that vibration conduction into the oval window and into the cochlea. And in our inner ear, those age-related changes include loss of neuronal number and function, so loss of nerve and neuron fibers, and this causes delayed or impaired processing more along the auditory uh, nerve. One such change that we see commonly in the inner ear that is an age-related change is presbycusis. And this is the number one communication disorder of our age population and the most prevalent neurodegenerative disease. It causes loss of ability to hear high-pitched sounds and sibilant consonants. When these sounds are filtered out, words become distorted and jumbled, and the sentences become incoherent. And so presbycusis, the, that impaired ability to um, understand and, art, uh, and hear those words, it's also called diminished speech discrimination. And that is, is further influenced by environmental factors such as the person's rate and background noise. So if we were looking at health promotion for presbycusis or the loss of the ability to hear high frequency sounds, two big interventions would be um, to control for the background noise and to control the rate and articulation of speech. And here we're going to talk about more risk factors then that affect our hearing wellness. So many risk factors go into hearing loss, such as a genetic predisposition. This includes older age, the male gender, and white race. Exposure to noise is, a, is the number one preventable um, risk factor for hearing loss. And at sometimes it can be treatable, which we'll see in the next slide. Impacted cerumen, this also is the leading cause of hearing loss, which is preventable and treatable. So, so watching out for impaction, um, vigilant monitoring, and clearing out the wax when, it, when we are noticing changes in our hearing. There's also occupational and um, recreational exposure to noise. So occupations that are around high noise would be military workers, gunfire, you know, construction workers and their power tools and traffic, um, along with recreational loud noises would be listening to loud music, listening to headphones too loud, hunting, um, riding motorcycle, etc. Some toxic chemicals in the workplace or environment include heavy metals like lead and mercury, asphyxiates, and carbon monoxide. And smoking greatly increases the risk for hearing loss and capillary damage to the middle and inner ear. Ototoxic medications include our aminoglycosides, which are gentamicin, which are antibiotics, right? As well as loop diuretics like furosemide, which a lot of older adults are on, as well as salicylates like aspirin, which again, older adults are more likely to take these medications. And we might attribute that hearing loss to an age-related change when in reality, it is the medications that are causing hearing loss and maybe we can change those meds. There are med certain medical conditions that also are gonna put a patient at risk for hearing loss, such as diabetes, hypertension, Meniere's disease, and cardiovascular disease. So what are the types of sounds and, and where do we hear these different frequencies and intensities at? Well, even in the absence of risk factors, normal age-related changes affect frequency, causing hearing problems for many older adults. The National Institute for Occupational Safety and Health, so OSHA, they enforce safety standards for workplace conditions that pose a risk for hearing loss. However, many of our older adults that we are seeing and caring for have been exposed to these harmful work environments long before these standards and policies were made. Um, but looking at the graph here, we can see um, the intensity is the loudness of, of um, of noises, right? So in general, anything over 80 
decibels is potentially harmful to the ears. And then we have frequency, which is a high or a low pitch. And as we age, the inability to discriminate with high pitch noises um, gets lost. So this graph is showing us the, uh, I think they call it a banana alphabet or something of hearing. And so you can see up by the birds, there's that T, H, S, and F noise, those are high frequency um, letters that usually get lost in hearing as an age-related change. A commonly occurring risk factor for hearing loss is the prolonged or intermittent exposure to noise. And again, we talked about how this is an important preventable type of hearing loss. And short-term exposure, like if we go to a really loud concert, it can cause temporary hearing loss. So you kind of remember, like, if you've gone to a really loud place or concert, you get out into the, in, and you're getting walking to your car, you can barely hear anything. <laughs> um, that is reversible. However, prolonged exposure is cause, causes permanent hearing loss due to a gradual destruction of our sensory cells in the inner ear. Uh, health promotion uh, activities then for noise-induced hearing loss, again, is environmental noise control uh, and hearing, uh, hear, oh, hearing conservation at work, like the protective, personal protective equipment that we would wear. So environmental noise control um, could be avoidance of the continued exposure to noise levels greater than 70 or 80 decibels. And then the hearing conservation would be having an analysis by OSHA of the noise exposure, wearing hearing protectors, getting periodic hearing screening, and then educating the workforce on loud noises and how important it is to protect your ears to prevent hearing loss. Another uh, medical term and hearing loss that I want to identify here in this slide is tinnitus. Tinnitus is a persistent sensation of ringing, roaring, or buzzing that doesn't actually have an external environmental source, and it's usually accompanied by a, senso, a sensory neural hearing loss. And so tinnitus, for U.S. military veterans, tinnitus and hearing loss are the two most prevalent causes of service-induced disability, and that's because, again, we go to gunshot traffic, um, uh, power tools were all used kind of in, in military and our older uh, adults, you know, didn't have that education about prevention. Quick check your understanding, which is the most prevalent risk factor for impaired hearing? So the use of ototoxic meds, exposure to noise, age-related changes of the ear, or genetic factors? And so this, the answer is B, exposure to noise. The most prevalent risk factor for impaired hearing is exposure to noise, which can be viewed as both a lifestyle choice and an environmental factor. Prolonged or intermittent exposure to noise during occupational or leisure activities is a common and usually avoidable risk factor for damage to our auditory system. Going on, let's talk about the types of hearing impairment. The most recent data from the National Center for Health Statistics in 2016 reports that one third of people between 65 and 74 have hearing loss, and over half of those over age 75 have hearing loss. So as we age, the risk is higher. Hearing impaired is categorized according to the site of impairment as conductive hearing loss, which occur in the external and middle ear, affecting conduction and sound vibration passage, and sensory neural hearing loss, which arise from abnormalities of the inner ear. Hearing is a primary component of communication. So negative functional consequences of hearing loss could be the mal effects on communication and different effects on our overall wellness. Interference in communication and interaction with others can be the source of many problems for the patient and caregiver. So accurate comprehension of speech depends on our pace, the frequency, environmental noise, and our internal auditory function. Adequate hearing enables people to enjoy humor, appreciate music, obtain information, relate to others, and respond to safety threats. Thus, hearing deficits can cause risks to a person's safety, functioning, and quality of life in numerous ways, which we're going to go into deeper now. 
The following functional consequences have been identified related to hearing loss, and these are negative functional consequences. Uh, diminished cognitive function. This is important to talk about because poor performance on cognitive tests can mistakenly lead to a perception that the person has a cognitive impairment or the beginnings of dementia when it's actually just hearing loss and they are not catching the conversation. Functional decline is multifactorial uh, related to an increased dependence because they're unable to get their information from another, from the, uh, by themselves from a source which can, may or may not lead to social isolation, which is uh, withdrawing from, from the community, either because they um, are embarrassed or because they, they're mad about the hearing loss, um, or, and the ability to function independently, even with difficulty hearing. Another negative consequence could be loneliness or isolation as there's diminished participation in social activities and group activities. So it is important when we're talking about isolation and loneliness, we wanna ask about changes in social activities and even ask about their attitudes related to those social activities. Like my dad is has hearing loss and um, he doesn't mind <laughs> removing himself from social activities. He um, doesn't, he's never liked being, you know, parts of big crowds and that small talk and all the stuff that goes along with it. So for him, he kind of likes that he has this hearing impairment, I think, to kind of pull away from the group. Diminished emotional vitality. What that means is um, emotional vitality is defined as a high level of happiness and a sense of personal mastery with low levels of anxiety and depressive symptoms. And so the patient might have diminished emotional vitality along with the others that we see here. So nursing assessment of hearing, the goal of nursing assessment is to identify risk factors, assess awareness and presence of, an, of a probable or, or actual hearing deficit, assess if hearing loss is acknowledged by the individual and identify opportunities for education about health promotion and prevention. Often the patient refers or refuses to admit or might be aware of their impaired hearing. Irritability is a common manifestation because of the concentration which with the patient must listen just to understand speech. The loss of clarity of speech in the patient with sensory neuro hearing loss is most frustrating. So we might see withdrawal, suspicion, loss of self-esteem and insecurity, um, which are common displays of advanced hearing loss. Other clinical manifestations we might see are like the patient, you know, keep telling, repeatedly asking, you know, to repeat what you're saying, speak up. Um, and when we're assessing hearing, you know, looking at the impact on safety or quality of life, many times patients are pressured by others like their spouse or their, or their family um, or a significant other because of their relationships and inability to communicate. So nurses have a variety of assessment tools to assess hearing loss and nurses assess hearing by using an otoscope to examine the ear a tuning fork to check hearing, which we could use the Weber and the Rhine methods, which are outlined in your book. Um, the otoscope can identify impacted cerumen and other factors that interfere with hearing, where the tuning fork actually detects the hearing impairment and it can differentiate between conductive um, and sensory neural losses. Another assessment tool that we use is the hearing handicap inventory for the elderly. This is a 10 item question that's administered in about five minutes, and it assesses the presence of functional consequences of hearing loss. So some of the questions we might see on that HHIES is, uh, do, does a hearing problem cause you to feel embarrassed when you meet new people? Or does a hearing problem cause you difficulty when listening to the TV or radio to assess the, fun the functional consequences again of hearing loss? Other assessment tools are assessing attitudes and perceptions regarding hearing aids and other interventions to move towards education and promotion. Um, some common barriers to the use of hearing aids or to the, to the um, obtainment of hearing aids is one, concerns about cost, how expensive it may or may not be, two, uh, perception that hearing aids are of little use, three, difficulty arranging for transportation and evaluations, 
four, embarrassment about the visibility of hearing aids, and five, a lack of manual dexterity necessary to utilize those smaller devices. Other assessment tools we can use is behavioral cues, and that's important when an older adult is unaware of a hearing deficit or in their denial about a hearing loss. So we might see such things such as avoidance of group settings, not using the hearing aids that have been purchased, turning one ear towards the speaker, or frequent requests or repetition um, um, of, of asking for frequent repetition of what someone has been saying. The last point, making referrals, this is that whenever a hearing deficit or a probable deficit has been identified, making referrals for further evaluation is important um, for medical and audiology evaluation. Now we get to our nursing interventions for hearing loss. Firstly, it's important to address that hearing loss is not an inevitable and inconsequential effect of growing older. We want to emphasize that everyone can take action to protect their hearing. Um, and we want to make older adults aware that the exacerbational effects of two risk factors such as noise and age-related changes really compounds the problem. And what I mean by this is that the older adult is much more susceptible to noise-induced hearing loss due to those degenerative changes of the, of, you know, the um, ossicles calcifying or the degeneration of the cochlea um, where we are going to be more prone to hearing loss. So prevention under promoting hearing loss, this includes quitting smoking, limiting our exposure to loud noise, and wearing ear protectors. And this also includes doing early detection, annual exams, and treatment of hearing loss. Uh, table box 16.6 talks about evidence-based practice guidelines for impacted serumen. And so we, the kind of gist of that box is that we want to teach older adults about using ceruminolytic agents, so those agents that can break up, like a Dubrox solution, break up, uh, moisten the wax so it will, it will um, you know, flow out, not inserting Q-tips into the ear and making sure our hearing aids are properly cleaned and cared for, because hearing aids actually increase the risk for impaction. Helping compensate for hearing deficits, we can do this through assistive listening devices. These are any devices that amplify sounds, like a stethoscope for us. Some devices uh, use vibratory stimuli to substitute, such as alarm clocks. Or we can see the use of closed captioning to follow along with television broadcasts and movies. The advantages of assistive listening devices is that they're cheaper than hearing aids in some instances. Um, and can be shared like in public places, like the, the closed caption television. Um, but they work best, these assistive listening devices work best in addition to hearing aids. So hearing aids then are battery operated devices that have an amplifier, a microphone and a receiver. The patient does not, um, does need an initial evaluation by a qualified hearing care professional so that they can get fitted for the right hearing aid and that that professional can detect the type of hearing loss if it's sensory neural or if it's conductive hearing loss so that we can do adequate pr um, promotion. So what nurses can do then with those hearing aids is address the negative attitudes through education. We can talk about the different types, what they might look like, different features such, such, such as Bluetooth with different cell phones, uh, and the medical follow-up needed. Another um, way to help compensate for hearing deficit is the use of auditory rehab. And so this is using a, uh, using a hearing professional, and they can improve, they've been shown to improve cognitive and social function in older adults, but utilization rates are very, rates are very low. But this rehab is usually done with an audiologist, and it consists of counseling, education, the use of amplification aids, and communication skills. Lastly, cochlear implants are surgically implanted electronic devices which bypass the damaged portions of the inner ear and stimulate the auditory nerve. In a study, um, oh, I want to say it was in 2016, all patients who use these cochlear implants had improvements in speech perception. And please draw your attention to box 16.9, which discusses good communication techniques, how to improve communication with someone with hearing loss or deficit. This is essential to assisting our older adults in compensating. So in pre presbyscus, that fast 
haste speech and environmental noise were the number one reasons that frequency was further diminished, thus improving our clarity of words, slowing the rate of speech, and eliminating environmental noise and distractions are going to make the most impact. So here's a case study. A 79-year-old widow comes to the family practice clinic where you work. You notice he speaks unusually loud and seems to misunderstand what you say quite frequently. So what should you do? In this case, we'd want to use those communication aids like sitting directly in front of the patient so they can see our lips, we can make eye contact, and talking slowly, adjusting our rate, um, adjusting our speed, uh, reducing environmental noise, those things are going to help with a possible, you know, proboscis or hearing deficit. We also want to do a focused assessment on his current complaints, but also ask questions related to this hearing deficit, such as seeing if he acknowledges it or even is aware, um, because we want to be sensitive that he may not realize his deficits and how loud he is speaking. So, let's see. After talking for a bit, SR confides in you that he worked in a factory that was very loud. He retired 10 years ago. He, tipped on, he tripped on the steps and hit his head last night. What types of hearing loss could he be experiencing? Um, so going kind of on the first one, uh, it could be hearing loss associated with aging such as the proboscis and losing that frequency of noises. It could be hearing loss from impacted wax, so we would need our otoscope to look and see if there was impaction. Or it could be hearing loss from an infection, so again, getting our otoscope and looking at that tympanic membrane, seeing if there's fluid filled or, or edematous and inflammation. Also, hearing loss from damage to the ear, so he hit his head, could be possible that's resulting on um, nerve damage. Lastly, oh, he worked in that factory that was very loud, so he could have um, hear the, the noise-induced hearing loss by that chronic exposure to sounds over 80 decibels. You continue your assessment and realize SR was recently placed on antibiotics for a UTI. So we say this because why is a complete review of medications especially important? Well, we've identified a patient who is, look, seems like he's having a hearing deficit. He's talking loudly. He's asking us to repeat. He has risk factors such as working in the factory. Um, he's 79 years old, right? Um, so we want to know what kind of antibiotic he's on because many of them are ototoxic like the gentamicin. And we also know that over-the-counter medications, including aspirin, might increase our symptoms of hearing loss um, or tinnitus, which might also contribute to why he fell last night. So we should look at which medications he's on to see if we can reverse that hearing disturbance. Lastly, please go onto this website and use our hearing loss simulator. It's great, or not ours. It was by a company called Phonak, but they put together a group of audio files that simulate what someone with a sensory neural hearing loss is able to hear in context, such as a, a restaurant, um, piano music, birds. It's really, really cool. So please go check it out. <laughs>